See, you got the chief man. Let me talk to him. Can you talk Indian? I was born in Indianapolis. It's the Marx Brothers Council Podcast. This is episode number 46, The Riding the Range. Hi, this is Bob Gassell, and uh, normally this is where I introduce my co-hosts, but to be honest, I only do that for the benefit of people who've never heard the show before. And if this is the episode where you've chosen to jump in and listen to us for the first time, what the hell is wrong with you? Okay, so let me just say, Noah, Matthew, how are you guys doing today? We're fine. I picked the wrong week to stop sniffing blue. (laughs) You know, we've put this off as long as possible. In fact, and this is a true story, we were supposed to record yesterday, but both Matthew and myself forgot <laughs> that we were going to record. So <laughs> Conveniently forgot we I were know. supposed to have a long Go West conversation. <laughs> I, I, I sat here discussing the film by myself for a couple of hours. And still had more fun than you did watching it. <laughs> still still okay. can't reach a consensus yet. So, yeah. So, if you don't know by now, today we're going to talk about Go West. And, you know, I have a history of uh, not being fond of this film. Half of it is true. Half of it is just sort of put on because I like to make jokes about things and it's an easy target. But, you know, in rewatching the films throughout the uh, time we've been doing the podcast, my opinion on some of the films has has changed. Um, Some are better than I remembered. Coconuts, Room Service, The Big Store, they've sort of improved in my uh, ranking since I've watched them for the uh, podcast. And a couple of them are not quite as highly ranked as I had um, had them before. Uh, Monkey Business and Night Casablanca. While I still love them both, maybe they weren't quite as good as I remembered. Now, when it comes to Go West, I have to say that I was expecting to like this more than I had in the past because, you know, I derided it for so long that I figured, oh, it can't be that bad. It's going to be better than I remember, like room service was, like the big store was. But guess what? The film threw me for a loop because it was actually much worse than I remember. (laughs) Okay. I got to say. But to be fair, everything is subjective. And the term better and worse might not be the right qualification here. Let me just say that I enjoy it less than I enjoy any other Marx film. It gives me less of what I watched the Marxes for. Guys, what do you think? I had a similar experience pretty recently when we recorded episode 42. That was our hot takes episode. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen Go West in a long time when we did that. And I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to watch Go West and I'm going to decide that it's better than we thought. And my hot take is going to be a positive take on Go West. Or at least I wanted to be able to argue that it was a little better than At the Circus. Um, and as you may recall, I watched Go West. I gave it every opportunity. I gave it every chance. You know, I tried so hard, not even to love it, but just to think it's 1% better than At the Circus, and I couldn't even get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I still had to fast forward bits of it. Um, I really, you know, I hate myself for having to do that, but, uh, but, but I did. It's, it's the one where, the, where even the good bits are bad. <laughs> now, to be fair, I don't want to uh, insult people who like this film, you know. Oh, I do. (laughs) I think a lot of my uh, disenchantment with it has to do with expectations, what I want it to be, what it should be. If I had never seen the Marx Brothers before, just came across this film, I might have thought it's pretty funny. If this was the first film you saw of the Marxes when you were 11 years old, I have no problem if you enjoyed it back then and and still hold the torch for it. Um, I've what what I should say the the one little bit of mitigation I I can offer is I'm I'm not somebody who who digs westerns anyway it's not a genre that that attracts me i don't like the look of it i don't like the the costumes the you know there's nothing about it attracts me i I like some individual westerns on their own merit but i'm i'm not somebody like my my mum for instance who adores westerns um so so it, it it already has an inbuilt barrier there and i suspect that a lot of why i vastly prefer the big store is because they're not in the Old West. It's funny you should mention that. The other day I was thinking, maybe I just don't like comedy westerns. I'm a, I like Orland Hardy, but Way Out West is not one of my favorites of theirs. But then 
Blazing Saddles came on, and that's one of my favorite comedies of all time. So it's hard for me to say that a comedy western can't work because I I love that film. But uh, I think we might make a distinction between comedy westerns and parodies of westerns. You know, okay. yeah. I mean, Blazing Saddles. One of the things about it that works so well is that. It's such an affectionate and knowing satire of every Western you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, but a movie like Go West, it doesn't even have the satirical angle that the Marx Brothers Paramount films do. You right. know, it's not a parody of Westerns unless you just putting the Marx Brothers in one makes it a parody, which I don't think it really does. It's a comedy Western. It's a period dress comedy. But they did lean in that direction a couple of times with the references to inventions that weren't around yet and Groucho making fun of you know, how did they do this with the gun in the holster? So they at least hinted that they mm. were looking at this from the outside. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, I think it's a mistake, to be honest, to, to put them in anything other than, a, than a, a realistic modern situation. So I would be, you know, I would disapprove of them in, in, in any, um, you know, historical setting. But, but there's something about the dustiness and the brightness and the drabness of westerns that i just think comedy has to work a hundred times harder and and this one you know needs all the help it can get i i understand what you're saying and i was also thinking that there are a lot of times in the marx's early uh, career particularly in the early days where they do something that is not characteristic of them but they make it work because it's you know, because they had good material, like the football game in Horse Feathers. There's no reason that should be a good scene, but it is because they inject their personality and, you know, it's it's well done. So it's not necessarily that it has to be a good or bad idea. It just has to be well done. And this is just not mm. well done. Mm. I think in, in, their, in their golden days on Broadway, they did often appear in period dress, you know, for an interlude, uh, mm -hmm. the Napoleon scene and its equivalents in, in Coconuts and Animal Crackers, there would always be this big set piece where the Marxists would come out in elaborate period costumes. And that seems to have always worked quite well. There's a trace of it in the film version of Coconuts. Yeah. Um, but I guess part of the difference there is that it, it is satirical because it's an interlude. Yeah. It's always a scene where the Marx Brothers are putting on a reality that's different from the rest of the show that it's part of. Um, and also those costumes were just a lot of fun. I mean, it's not fun seeing Harpo and Chico in, you know, plaid flannel shirts and boots, you know, there's, Groucho gets mm. a little more fun out of his costumes right. in Go West, but not much. Um, and I think that's a big problem here too. The idea of like dressing them up differently, and uh, I don't, I don't think that was doomed to fail. But the technique here is certainly doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. And as I've said many, many times before, and this is not meant as a joke or a slight to anyone, but this film and this script would have been much, much better in the hands of the Three Stooges. Mm. It's much more in line with their sensibilities, um, them being in over their heads in a situation that they're not in control of. Um, you know, it, I think it would have been the highlight of their career. I did, there were just so many moments in the film where I said, oh, this would have been better with Mo, or this would have been better with Curly. That, that's, that's really how I feel. Groucho actually has his Mo moment there, doesn't he? Where he, he hits yeah. Harper with a hammer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's ready and waiting for them, really. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of what's a little depressing about the movie, if you're if you're going into it with the point of view of loving the Marx Brothers, mm. is that it does kind of make them, you know, sort of interchangeable with other comedy teams. Not mm. to knock other comedy teams, but the Marx Brothers doing other teams' material never would have made any sense before. Mm. And now you feel like we kind of have arrived at this insert comedians here point. And as far as comparing it to these other late MGMs, at least from my perspective... This is definitely the least of all those because at the circus, even though it has all the faults of parts of Go West, it also has a number of really good high points. It's got Margaret Dumont. It's got it's got a few good moments where you're generally enjoying yourself. The big store doesn't have any of that, but none of it is cringeworthy. It's it's just pleasant enough and meanders along and you and you watch it with a nice little crooked smile, maybe all the way through. Uh, <laughs> but Go West, I don't know. It's just like Matthew. Sometimes you just want to fast forward or or throw the DVD player out the window. <laughs> 
And anyone who tells me that brain donors doesn't have more laughs than this doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, I can't argue with you there either. Although I will say that one one thing I can say to, um, as you put it, Matthew, mitigate my my negative feelings here is that the worst of the Marx Brothers movies when reviewing them to talk about them on the podcast, I do always find they have more laughs in them than I thought. Mm-hmm. I mean, when we did at the circus for the podcast, I remember thinking you know, there's like seven good lines in this movie. And then watching it again, you realize, no, there's like, there's like 15 good lines in this movie. <laughs> and, you know, Go West has, has 10 and not four, you know. Yeah. I, I counted one, but, but <laughs> we'll <laughs> as we go along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into the background of this. Um, the idea for a film called Go West was first broached right after Night at the Opera. Thalberg put two things into development, A Day in the Races and a film called Go West. And I believe Kummer and Ruby, did Thalberg actually put them on it, even though he didn't want them to do Night at the Opera? I'm, I'm a little confused by that. I'm not clear on the politics there, but I know Kalmar and Ruby wrote that original Go West script. Right, but was, I wonder if that was after Thalberg had, had passed away. Anyhow, for whatever reason that uh, the film got put off until after uh, At the Circus, at which time the original concept of the Marxes in a contemporary rodeo was changed to a to a vintage Western. The only thing they kept was the uh, title, Go West. I've, I've not read that um, Gum and Ruby script. I don't know if you have, Noah, but... Um... I, I, I've heard I've heard differing things about it. I mean, I think inevitably it, it has to shine in comparison with with what we've got here in this movie. Um, and uh, I've certainly heard, uh, for instance, John Taft tell us who, who's, who owns a copy, and he says it's it's really really good. Um, Joe Joe Adamson has also read it, and he's much less enamored of it. If I if I remember correctly, I think I'm right in saying um, he he said you know it's it's better. What wouldn't be but it's it's you know it's not really all that either if i've got this right joe in his book says that arthur sheikman told him he had read he sheikman had read the kalmar and ruby go west script and said it was one of the funniest things he's ever read and adamson i think this is in his notes at the back of the book he calls this a subject for further research if ever there was one i think in the years since the book was published, Joe had an opportunity to read the screenplay, and that's how he formed his uh, somewhat tempered opinion of it. Um, I haven't read it myself, so I can't tell you. It's interesting that Groucho in particular, in fact, all the brothers were not happy with the way At the Circus turned out. And you would think they would go in a totally different direction, but they ended up with the same screenwriter and the same director. I mean, I, I guess that wasn't their original choice, but things just turned out that way, right? Hmm. I mean, it is interesting that 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 Groucho, you know, singled out the direction of about the circus as as you know the cause of of the things that he was unhappy about in his. And and yet we do we have a, a returning director. I think for only the second time after McLeod, isn't it? He's the only Sam Wood. Oh, Sam Wood. Sam Wood. So whether that was just again a case of Groucho not just not caring enough to, to bother um, or, or not having any clout at all by that time. I, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I think, to, I think it's, it's a, it's better from that perspective than at the circus. I think he, although, although he's still recognizably that same weird Groucho, I, I think he is better here. No question about it. Yeah. And in the, yeah. and, and the, the first scene in the movie, which I, I know we'll get to in detail, um, uh, Groucho's performance seems, it seems like he's back. Later in the film, he regresses to at the circus, Groucho. But <laughs> uh, he also, when he's wearing that hat, you don't have to deal with what's on, under it. <laughs> yeah. Just like the uh, opening scene of at the circus, actually. Yes. We should mention that uh, the brother's unhappiness with uh, at the circus did lead to, uh, them mounting a, a short road tour for Go West. And, you know, everyone likes to mention, can you imagine these comedy scenes before the road tour? I mean, if this is what they ended up with. <laughs> but um, <laughs> apparently, 16 millimeter films and some audio recordings were made uh, for reference. Now, the odds of these still existing and coming to light are probably pretty slim, but you never know what Mr. Uh, Tefteller or Mr. Bader have, have up their sleeve. Well, that's um, Casablanca audio turned yeah. up out of nowhere, didn't it? Yeah, so yeah absolutely, yeah. You, you never know. 
one does wonder what a Go West tour could possibly have looked like. It seems like there, it doesn't seem like there's even 30 minutes of stageable yeah. comedy material in the movie. Yeah. Um, and I, you make an interesting point in your book, Matthew, that the way they, the way they were approaching a road tour at this point could easily have hurt the material more than helped it. That in, you say that in the way that their, their best scripts were probably sharpened by those sophisticated 1920s Broadway audiences that saw them, you know, just a couple of dates, uh, you know, far off in the hinterlands or military bases, as you put it, it probably would have brought out um, the the roughest stuff in the material, the broadest and most physical, mm -hmm. um, and sophistication probably wouldn't have gone over as well. Yeah. Um, do we know what they what they did? I know that the Indian reservation scene they did, I presume they, they must have done the first scene. I, I suspect they mm -hmm. did the robbing the safe as well, because I, I'll bet they did that, yeah. splitting the stage in half. There are some reviews of this road tour, which we've uh, uncovered, and they are not uh, kind to the uh, material. They say the audience did not respond well, and it does need quite a bit of work. Um, they do mention that the, the audience did perk up a bit during the safe cracking scene, but that's about it. And, you know, even after the tour was over, uh, they, they still weren't happy because they basically shut down production and did a major rewrite even after the tour. Now, I think it was just to redo all the framing sequences around the scenes that they had done on tour, but still, no one was really enthused uh, going into this. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. just looking at some um, some of the, the cuttings I've, I've got about the, the road tour, and they did they did do that so i'm i'm literally just seeing this for the first time since i saved it a couple of years ago um and they did do the robbing the safe scene and every time harpo made a noise in the other room groucho and chico uh rushed to a piano and and covered it up with music mm -hmm. which i would have thought would be funnier than what we've got well i think you mentioned in the book that that scene probably played a lot better on stage than it did in the film when yeah. you could, when you could see the split room it's very strange in the film how they don't use that at all. I mean, mm. you have the two rooms, the adjoining rooms. Where we've seen that set up twice before, and it's been great. Um, and then they, they do nothing with it. Um, you know, not even a little Annie Hall psychoanalysis joke, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> nothing at all. And, and uh, it does feel like that scene has had its guts taken out for some reason. So are we ready to jump into this? Um, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So those horrible credits. <laughs> oh, wait, let me, let's, let's talk about the trailer for a moment. Have you seen that? They introduced the, the brothers and there's shots of each of them, but the one of Chico, he seems to be uh, asleep, falling asleep, which, uh, <laughs> And it's got an extra line as well, isn't it? Gretchen what? saying it's just like a movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's just like a movie. Yeah. So on to the film, which opens, as you said, with the awful MGM title cards and generic credits um even after it's <laughs> over they tried to be funny with an exposition card but all that says to me th is that i'm in for a, a shit show I, I don't know how else to put it <laughs> but i do have to say the first couple of minutes of the film as groucho arrives and when he first meets harpo and chico i think that's my favorite part of the film i think that's the best part up until the point they start with the whole you know, rip off with the dollar and the whole scam that Chico and Harpo are trying to pull. I, I I don't care for that. But the first minute or so, Groucho has a couple of good lines. You know, he tells the the porters to keep the luggage. Although I do have to say that when he's ten dollars short, he seems to have left much more than ten dollars worth of uh, materials with the porters because there were uh, saddles and polo mallets and all sorts of things that he certainly could have <laughs> sold for more than ten dollars. But I like that. I quite like that keep keep the luggage bit, but un yeah. uh, th unfortunately, th sort of through no fault of its own. I mean, this is just me being picky, but it's the first of something that I've noticed quite a, a few, few of through the film, which is which is moments that that recall much better moments in earlier films. So here, I'm irresistibly reminded of his of his animal crackers entrance, mm. uh, and y y you know, um, from Africa to here, a dollar eighty five. You know, yeah. it's it's like that, but not as good. And as we go through, there there are several other moments like that yeah. that really you recall something better. So um, I, I really don't much care for this scene at all, to be honest. It's got some awful lines in it. 
Yeah. And as far as recalling the earlier stuff, um, yeah, of course it happens, but it doesn't bother me so much because you have to remember that people hadn't seen, you know, Duck Soup or Animal Crackers or Date the Races in a number of years. Mm. So it's not like it was fresh on their minds. Uh, you know, people today watch the Marx films and they watch a couple within a few weeks or a few months or within a year or two, but that's not the way people watched the Marxes back then. The gags and the situations weren't fresh in their memory like they are now. I actually really like this scene, and, and um, I, I think... Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Groucho's performance is fine here, and that's such a relief. He's back at a day at the races level, um, mm. although later in the movie he will, he will disappoint us. Um, he's good, and, you know, it's true that the standards for material are, are very low. There's a lot of bad jokes and non jokes, and, you know, I mm. thought that was fungus with buttons. It's just, what mm. are you even talking about? But First business I also I've ever think, done with a dust storm. Yeah, mm. terrible. No, just no, no, no justification. However, I do think there are uh, some great lines in it. Um, I really like when Chico asks where the train is. Uh, he, he's here for, for the train, and Groucho says, "It's out on the tracks. It rarely comes in here." Uh, th- I think that's a great joke. Um, I, I know Matthew, you're not crazy about. Uh, you, you love your brother, don't you? No, but I'm used to him. Um, well, I don't mind it, but. <laughs> I, but, I really people like always that like line. point to it as this great line, you know. So how could you not right. like that joke? <laughs> it's, it's a little too it's a little too cute, but I, I like it. Yeah. Um, I, I really think Chico gets a great joke when um, he has to explain why Harpo doesn't have nine dollars, even though Groucho just gave it to mm. him, and he says he sends money home to his mother. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mm. The main comic premise here, the con that they're pulling on Groucho with the. Ten dollar bill attached to a string is is not that great. It's not worthy of them. But the incidental moments, I think yeah. there are actually more laughs in this scene for me than there are in the Tootsie Fritzy scene, which has a somewhat more clever premise. I mean, for most people, this you know, it it is a, a great beginning and a great ending, and nothing in the middle is. That's the kind of the, the received wisdom about the film. But um, I think when even the good bits are as iffy as these are, I think you 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 really are in in trouble. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, we we've said before that this is an, an Abner and Costello type scene, which which it is. Um, on the other hand, you know, I mean, obviously, it is model. It has obviously been decided now since the day of the races that there has to be a, a Chico or Harpo uh, fleecing Groucho scene. So it's it's in the tradition of the of the badge scene and the cigars and the Tootsie Fruit scene. You know, so it's you know it's okay. It's not a it's not a terrible scene. But uh, I just think you know if this is as good as it gets, and we're right at the start of the movie. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of in trouble. Oddly enough, Groucho um, claimed that when they took it on the road, uh, it was him conning Chico and Harpo, yeah, right. and it didn't get any laughs, so he, he rewrote it um, to, to conform exactly to the model of the previous two films. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. I've also forgotten who wrote this, but the, the, um, is, it, is it Nat Perrin? It's not Brecker, is it? There's... Um, I think Noah, you found in the in the Groucho collection a, um, a copy of the of the Road to a Script. I've I've got it somewhere, um, and it says on the front uh, whatever it's called scene, uh, and it's written by somebody else. I think it's Nat Perrin. It's it's one of yeah. their other well known writers. Yeah, I think so. Oh, I don't recall. I'll have to check. You know, it drives me crazy that um, Groucho's getting fleeced here, and he's sort of suspicious, but he never calls him on it. You know, he's sort of like, oh, I feel mm. a draft down here, but he, but he doesn't do anything about it. I mean, why, why would he just allow himself to be fleeced like this? It's not like an opera where they've gone off on such a tangent that it doesn't really matter. Here he wants to not lose his money, but he seems to allow himself to get fleeced. Mm. And the scene doesn't really go anywhere special. I mean, the best Marx Brothers scenes build insanity on top of insanity on top of insanity, and you end up in a place you never expected. This is just a repetition of the same bit. And you know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen next. And when you know what's going to happen next, that's not a good Marx Brothers scene. Mm. And one more little aside here. It, it always drives me crazy when Chico and Harpo are portraying brothers in a film, because that implies that if Harpo could talk, he would be talking just like Chico. <laughs> and, and that drives me crazy. Yeah, so after Groucho has been handed his hat, or whose hat does he throw on and walk out? Yeah, Harpo switches the uh. the beaver hat that Groucho sold him with 
Groucho's uh, top hat, which contained some money. Okay. So we, next we but, move. But this will not prevent Groucho from getting a train ticket somehow. We never know why. But the next I time we see Groucho. I just one more thing. Yeah. When um, Harpo is cutting Groucho's trouser leg. Yeah. Uh, to get the to get the money out, Chico and Gr- and Groucho are conversing, and their dialogue is rubbish. Uh, they haven't bothered to write anything funny. Well, you know what I say. I like to do business with a man like you because I knew you were honest the first minute I see you. A <laughs> cornerstone of my success oh, is integrity. That's right. That's and right. that's the only secure foundation. That's what I say. That's what when I see you, when I you know have you're that, honest. you have everything. That's right. <laughs> I know you. They should have written something funny, but in, they've they've given Groucho just a load of. Really, really crap dialogue because we're not listening to that. We're looking right. at it Harpo. Sh- it should be that we're focused on Groucho and Chico. And then, by the way, oh, look what Harpo did while we weren't paying attention. Yeah. You know? And they just yeah. haven't yeah. bothered at all. Right. I think it's, sometimes it feels to me like what they're attempting here is a, a perversity of attitude joke like in the old days where Groucho is so determined to make this – uh, a, a friendly and successful transaction that he is perversely ignoring his own discomfort and awareness that Harpo is cutting his pants and taking his money. And uh, something about Groucho's manner in that bit where he's saying, you know, the cornerstone of my success has been integrity and all, all that. Um, what is it? It's like, um, it's just doggerel, like business doggerel. Mm. It, it, that, that, what they might be attempting is um, to get some humor out of Groucho. Like he'd rather ignore the fact that he's being fleeced mm-hmm. than than face it. And it reminds me a little bit of some of his behavior in other times when he doesn't come out of a scene having accomplished his goal, but he's accomplished some form of social, um, you know, anarchy that... <laughs> Right, <laughs> <laughs> that is satisfying to the audience, mm-hmm. but they don't get those laughs here. It doesn't work, but I think that might be what they're trying to do. And so we move on to uh, set up our basic plot line with the uh, aptly named railroad board meeting. Uh, I guess it's not too bad. We quickly and painlessly meet our hero and villain and set up our plot line. Uh, any thoughts on this, gentlemen? It's nice to see him again, the Wolf Man. Walter Wolf King, um, I, I liked him a lot in opera, and it's and it, it it does fit. Oh, good, it's him again, and he looks very smart, doesn't he? In the, in his uh, in his western garb, he looks very very dapper. He and John John Carroll is that his name? They they're mm. very similar in appearance, and I I get them a yes. little confused at times. It's true, and they have kind of the same look as they're styled in the movie. Yeah. All the references in this film to Cripple Creek are perhaps interesting. Um, Cripple Creek is the town in Colorado where a teenage Groucho was stranded during his first vaudeville job in 1905. Um, Who knows if that's the reason why it's included here. It also comes up in Westerns all the time as a kind of standard um, gold gold rush town location. And in fact, the first narrative Western ever made in the cinema was filmed in Cripple Creek. But as far as getting any, you know, there's no, there's no humorous <laughs> importance to it here. Mm-hmm. But as occasionally in the movie, something comes up that resonates with the Marxist biography in ways that only their fans would know, uh, we can put this on that list. And yes, Matthew, it is a real place. You thought it was just a... I thought it was the, a Western cliche, you know. Uh, I thought it was the, the the topographical equivalent of head them up at the pass. But uh, yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's a real place. It's I think it's the home of Apple. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. No, no, is that right? <laughs> oh, no, <I'm> just <laughs> <laughs> That's Silicon Creek. You're thinking of. <laughs> Okay, now we move on to one of our favorite scenes, uh, the, the, the digging at Dead Man's Gulch. Yeah, oh, a Dead Man's Gulch, that's also a real place. My cousin's from Dead Man's Gulch. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we continue on, just a nitpick here. Why is Chico even there? In the opening scene, it was only Harpo who was heading out west. I don't, I don't know why Chico is even there. Uh, care to hypothesize, Noah? <laughs> a good point uh harpo must have quickly found some gold lying around and sent it back to him okay (laughs) okay and what are they digging exactly their own graves i don't i don't what what are they digging their own careers graves. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, they're looking for gold right that's the idea here right 
although this does seem to be a strange way to do it. Um, and there's a sort of <laughs> obvious sight gag with um, Harpo filling Chico's hole as he digs. And for the first time in a Marx film at MGM, you could really tell that this isn't a top-of-the-line budget. Uh, mm. <laughs> they got a cheap little set here, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have the cinematography of the great westerns. <laughs> <laughs> The film was made on the cheap. They had a, a clause in their contract that, that none of their uh, films should cost less than a million dollars. And this one came to 996000 And they actually got um, a £50,000 bonus on their salaries because um, the, the, the studio had skimped, which is why... Um, the big store cost more, but they put Tony Martin in above above the title as well uh, in, in compensation. Hmm. Yeah. So if the studio had spent another four thousand dollars on the movie, <laughs> they wouldn't have had to pay the Marx Brothers this additional. If they made a better set. Yeah. For, for, wow. the, for, for this, for it's this, crazy. let's be honest, most depressing comedy scene ever filmed. <laughs> yeah, it's just so they should have just offered the four thousand to Chico and say, "Here you go." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with that morbid, slowed down version of Oh Susanna as they as they're digging away, mm -hmm. you just you just want to die. One more cactus and a cow skull, and you've hit your budget, right? <laughs> so we spend several painful minutes with Harpo and Chico and this guy. Uh, Dan Wilson, Dan Wilson, whatever he is. Um, Matthew, you mentioned in your book that uh, there are stills around that show the scene being shot with with a different actor, right? Yeah, I mean this this guy is is Tully Marshall, who's um, a, a, a lovely actor, a really good actor who I particularly love um, when he turns up in pre code movies because he he often plays incredibly sleazy characters, um, the 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 kind of um, lawyers who represent gangsters and, mm -hmm. and are in on in on the scams, you know that that kind of but re really really good actor doing nothing here in this in this tiny little part. But yes, in stills, um, it's a well known character actor called Clem Bevans, um, totally different. Uh, face. So what happened there, I, I don't know. Maybe a, a reshoot or something and he wasn't available or why they then, yeah. you know, when when and got Tully Marshall, I, I don't know. Hmm. But you were saying, Bob, that there is there is a photograph of Dan Wilson later on and, and is that a... Yeah, later on when we see Eve playing the piano uh, on the top of the piano, there are a couple of photos, one of uh, her boyfriend and one of her, her grandpa. And it's And it's this one, it's Tully Marshall, is it? I think so. Um, I wouldn't bet my family on it, but I, I think somebody would have noticed by now if it wasn't. Yeah. All right. Hey, one more thing about this scene. Chico always looks very strange without a hat, and maybe never more so than here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that's the best you can say about the scene. That punchline with the arrow. My God. Yeah, that's what I was just going to talk about. It's yeah. just so depressing. Yeah, the scene, The only really the only attempt at a laugh in the scene is the very end. Mm. Once again, it recalls the moment in Animal Crackers where they take his coat and he's in his underwear. But there, he's in his undies by choice. And there are people there to be shocked. Here, it's sort of like... Oh, it's a pants-dropping gag. It's an, it's an arrow in the ass and a, a pants-dropping gag. Yeah. I mean, you could also say that the digging the two holes and Harpo emptying dirt into Chico's hole, it, it's a... It, it suggests the wonderful image in horse feathers of them sawing a hole around themselves, right. you know, in the floor. Yeah. But it just has everything that made that wonderful drained out of it. <laughs> that scene, of course, which also contains some uh, some Harpo uh, feigning modesty in his underwear as well, isn't it? When, uh, oh, indeed, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but much funnier. <laughs> much funnier, yeah. <laughs> okay, next we meet our heroine, uh, Miss... Uh, Diana Lewis playing Eve. And then comes perhaps my biggest, I think it was my biggest laugh of the film. I literally laughed out loud. And best bit that, of the film. Best bit of the film. When um, Diana and John Carroll first embrace, <laughs> we cut to a shot and there's a horse head blocking our view of them. 
for several seconds. And it's not like they're yep. kissing and they're like, oh, we're, we're being subtle and hiding the kiss. Mm. They're, they're literally yeah, talking. talking they? Yeah. Mm. yeah and, and the horse just <laughs> pulls away. Now, Matthew, in your book, you seem to think that this was inadvertent, but I... I, I did at first, but okay. but uh, people have pointed out to me that you can actually see, um, you can you can see it being, you know, maneuvered in and out of yeah. shot. So, so it is deliberate. It is the best bit of the film. I think the only thing that would improve it is if it was a running joke throughout the film. If at various <laughs> points, this horse's head would come up yeah. <laughs> and get in the way of the action. Yeah. But apart from that, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. Brilliant. Buzzle at his best. Oh, it should have happened oh, yeah, many, many more times in this film. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it was deliberate, what could the reason possibly be? Maybe it was some some uh, somebody's prize horse and they promised him the horse would be in the movie <laughs> or something like that. He might have put some money in. Yeah, yeah some guy, I'll put $10,000 into the picture <laughs> as long as my horse gets a nice moment. <laughs> but even so, why that? Buzz was going for an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> this was his showcase uh, all the hate in the dialogue is weird isn't it i mean you're a turner and i'm a wilson so we should hate each other and they're having fun with that but you know it's just a kind of a weird and i don't know it's a very off the mark attempt to get some romantic dialogue out of the idea of the children of feuding families being in love but it's just a little weird to see these two just you know kissing and canoodling and talking about how much they hate each other <laughs> <laughs> Oh, another great exchange. Another great Irving Brecker exchange is $50,000. 50000 what? <laughs> <laughs> it's unnecessarily complicated as well, isn't it? All this about because their families are feuding, he wants to re to divert the rail in order to impress her family. But the villa, you know, I mean, why, why can't it just be that they want they want the land? You know, as simple as yeah. that. Mm -hmm. You know, the villains want the land. So right. it, it, it's so complex. And then, then it's all abandoned, isn't it? All this, all this family feuding stuff is just, just goes by the wayside. Just when you were starting to care about it. Yes. <laughs> just when you were wondering about them, if they could possibly help those kids. Okay. <laughs> now, if you thought that was depressing when Harpo and Chico were digging their own graves, wait until they make their way in, into the saloon. Mm. Now, it starts out with them on the outside... And a gunfight breaks out, and they run and hide in horror. Rusty, I don't like it the West. All of the people do is kill each other. I'd like it the West better if it was in the East. <laughs> <laughs> and when they finally make their way in, uh, we're immediately reminded of the speakeasy from Horse Feathers, but this is about a, a million miles away. <laughs> there, Harpo basically <laughs> controlled the universe, but here, he can't even get something to drink. Yeah, and he just he steals one without any you know not cleverly at all he just goes and steals one gets caught gets humiliated and the only thing stupider than him getting caught like that is chico writing the iou on the back of the deed i mean mm. <laughs> come on that is something what an idiot yeah come on <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, it, there's always been a, a dumb quality to Chico's character, often a, a deceptively, right. intentionally dumb quality. Right. But who who would do this? Even I don't even think the Three Stooges would use the D <laughs> as an IOU. <laughs> well, maybe Shemp, I think, maybe. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> um, and then also the way that all the villains and toughs in the saloon uh, laugh at them, you know, they're yeah. objects mm. of derision. Yeah. And when the scene's over you realize that this wasn't really a comedy scene at all. It was a plot exposition mm. scene to get the, uh, the deed into the hands of the, uh, of the villain. So like, come on, Harpo and Chico in a saloon and you couldn't do five minutes of comedy before you got to the, uh, plot stuff. Yeah. That, I mean, that's the thing that I, that I find so hard to, to, uh, to kind of come around to is it, they haven't even been given bad comedy. Right. They just literally have not been given any comedy at all. They've got, you know, saloon scene, Chico and Harpo, and they don't do anything. I was thinking that how, you know, comparing this to horse feathers is like almost just not fair um, because we're so many worlds away from horse feathers at this point. But you know the scene, it's on the Marx Brothers television collection. There's a TV sketch with Harpo and Chico in an old Western saloon. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, that's not great Marx Brothers material. It's, you know, it's so-so, uh, but it's worlds funnier and better than this scene. Yeah. So they come out of the saloon and they're, they're, they're instructed to take a telegram 
to the Wilson house. And for some, whatever reason, they decide they're going to read it themselves. And I do like the idea that they're, they're going to read it and put their fingers in their ears and not listen. That's yes. a good idea. And, and the fact that the chick goes, Oh, yeah, you know what? I have to admit I did listen. And I was like, Yeah, I did too. But so that was a nice little moment. Yes, but, that works. Yeah. And then they end up at the depot where Mr. Beecher arrives and Harpo and Chico are looking for him. And then when he identifies himself, Mr. Beecher, we're here to meet you. Were Mr. you looking Be- for John Beecher? Oh, sure. We come here to see him about selling Dead Man's Gulch to the railroad. That's fine. <laughs> I'm John Beecher. We don't recognize you. Well, naturally, you don't recognize me. We've never met. Yeah, then how do I know it's you? Now, this unfortunately reminds me of the opening badge scene from At the Circus, where Chico is basically going against his own self interest. <laughs> At least it's short, you know. Yeah. It's it's not bad, I think, that joke. It's another one. Like, there's the seed of a good Marx Brothers idea here. Like, they, they, they know it's him already, but he has to be wearing a white carnation in order for them to recognize him and acknowledge him. You know, you, you could imagine that being the premise for a good Marx Brothers joke. Mm-hmm. Alas. And unlike in opera, uh, Mr. Walter Wolf King is quite engaging here. Um, actually, he hasn't done anything yet to uh, qualify as a villain, uh, um, I guess, other than wearing black. <laughs> he's, a, he's a little oily. <laughs> okay, now we come to the infamous stagecoach scene. I, I don't think this could have been done on, on stage during the road tour, do you think? Possibly, I think. Would it work without the motion? The well, I, but I, that's what I was thinking. Is they they might have done it with the motion because I'm sure they did the um, the the rocking um, cabin scene from A Night at the Opera, right? Um, which you know those those things are, are usually done with with people uh, with a you know with a set built onto the stage mm. and and some form of leverage underneath. So I wonder if they if they did that. I don't know. I think this scene's okay. I mean, it's not a classic, but it's decent enough. And in this film, that's nothing to sneeze at. It's all right. I mean, it, Harpo is is funny, isn't he? Uh, Harp, when 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 Harpo is allowed to to to, uh, it, it's it's probably the the most the closest we get to the you know the truly wild Harpo of of the Paramount films. Um, it has got some awful lines in it though, like uh, "Are you wearing a revolving door?" I mean, could they not have mm-hmm. come up with anything better than that? Yeah, this scene, it gets a little bit of chaos going, but it doesn't ever really add up to anything all that funny. Right. Um, yeah. This was the, the, the film, the, the scene that had the line I laughed at in, though, which I didn't remember the line at all, which is, uh, where did I see your face before? Right where it is now. That, that, <laughs> that made bad. me chuckle. <laughs> and they pick up Groucho along the way. I guess somehow he made his way out west. Yeah, it's the same way he. We don't know how he got on the train and at the circus. Um, it's like they're doing it deliberately now. You know, the circus one is because you know that that bit was cut out. You know, but but now it's like, oh, this is something Groucho does. He, he stopped from doing something and then he just does it. <laughs> he also that we meet him again. He's just kind of in the West, which incidentally is a destination in this reality. We should say that too. You can walk into a train mm. station in New York and say, one ticket for the West, please. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> all right. Anyway, I mean, you could be going to Ohio too. <laughs> um, but, and then he just coincidentally happens to be where this particular stagecoach picks him up and Groucho is reunited with Harpo and Chico. Just coincidentally. I mean, if these scenes were hilariously, brilliantly funny, we wouldn't care about these continuity problems, mm-hmm. but we don't have anything else to think about. So, Did we have any... Do you, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I missed it or it slipped my mind. Do we have any reason to know at this point why Groucho is heading west? To make his fortune, I think, you know, to exploit some suckers, which he never, ever does at any point. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of this hat-switching nonsense that's going on? It's another thing, like, we'll, we'll do a, try to recapture the magic of something we did earlier, you know, in Duck right. Soup, of course, the hat switching. There's also a moment where, uh, I think it's Walter Wolf King says, uh, I wash my hands of this, and uh, Groucho tries to sell him some soap. Mm. Um, you know, we had that same setup with a better punchline, mm. also in Duck Soup. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, as Noah pointed out to us uh, right before we started recording, that's actually... Lulu Bell on the stagecoach. Uh, I don't think either of us had noticed it was her. 
it answers so many questions about how he how he knows her, how he knows her name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's another indication of just the kind of ineptitude here. We're meeting a someone who will turn out to be a major character, um, but here she's just sort of an incidental passenger on this stagecoach. Yeah. Uh, she is June McCloy um, in her final film role. Uh, June McCloy was a Broadway star of the scandals and the vanities, um, and she made a few films. Um, best known as Eileen in uh, June Moon, the 1931 film of Kaufman and Lardner's June Moon. And and she was also a nightclub star and a singer. She has, as demonstrated later in this film, a very distinctive, uh, deep, husky singing voice. Yeah. Oh, actually, I'm reading my own book here, and I did know it was there on the stagecoach, so I've, I've just forgotten it again. Uh, well, consult yourself next time. You could learn something. <laughs> <laughs> And we have a June McCloy-related treat for our listeners. Uh, we have some pieces of a rarely heard interview that June McCloy gave in 1999. Hold on, I've got to deal with this cat. I'll say this again. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I just realized, I, instead of speaking into a microphone, I was speaking into the nether regions of a mammal. That was like the horse walking to Ingo West. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. That was perfect, actually. So our special guest ah. is the late June McCloy. <laughs> yeah, we have a we have an interview with June McCloy that you've never heard before. Um, this is from the year 1999. She was 90 years old, and she's being interviewed by our friend Peter Minton. And we want to thank Peter for uh, sharing this audio with us and allowing us to share it with you. Many of our listeners probably know Peter for his brilliant work as a musician and an historian of the Great American Songbook. Uh, and if you don't know Peter's work, uh, start with his YouTube channel, where, among other things, you can find his performances of The Monkey Doodle Doo and a message uh, from the man in the moon. Hmm. Uh, so uh, let's listen to a little bit of this. This is the year 1999. This is a 90-year-old June McCloy, very sharp, remembering her experiences making Go West. Go West, yeah. That Now that... Was the Bluebell, and you were from Louisiana. Louisiana, remember we stand up? And yeah. That yes, really, that was more fun than a barrel of monkeys. I like people, and I. This will give you a rough idea of the family I married into. I said one day, Neil's sister. That's you know my name is June. Yeah. Well, Neil's sister's name is June too. So we were visiting with June, and she was married to a chap whose first name was Butler. Hello, Butler Sanchez, not Mexican. Yeah. And, American Freudian, very Freudian, very nice guy. So I said, hey, you're going to go to see we Go West, John. She says, she said, listen to this. Says, I don't like the Marx Brothers. She didn't say, well, what are you doing in it? She didn't say it. She says, I, I said, well, June, I am in it. I, I'm not ashamed of what I did. I'd like you to see it. Mm -hmm. She said, well, we might go sometime. I was in, married into the goddamnedest family you ever heard of in your life. For a person that knows a little bit, very little, I admit, not more than that, of show business, to marry into a family that disregard everything concerning it. You were from Louisiana, and yeah. Iris Adrian was from Mississippi, and who was the girl from South Carolina? Is that, is that Woodbury? Oh, John Woodbury, of yeah. course. I never Joan Woodbury was married to Henry Wilcoxon. Now, there is another splendid Englishman. Yeah. Henry Wilcoxon was a peach of a guy, yeah. wonderful chap. Yeah. And he made the best trifles you've ever tasted. I never knew what a British trifle was till, yeah. till I met them. Yeah. No, we, John Woodbury, I couldn't figure yeah, out. Joan Woodbury, yeah, Joan Woodbury. And who was, who was the other? Who was the other? I can't. Iris Adrian. Iris Adrian. That must yeah. have been about her first movie. I, I know, I know. I wasn't big on Iris, but she was all right. Yeah. But I was big on, on uh, Joan Woodbury. Yeah. I liked her very much. We got on fine. I got on fine with all of them. I never got, people say, how'd you like Harpo? Does he really, does he ever talk? Like you wouldn't believe his vocabulary. <laughs> I guess. They had Bennett Surf there. They had a whole bunch of people from the Algonquin in New York. I mean, round table cats, that, yeah. you know, big time. Well, he was the only one that the, did uh, round table. He, they, the rest of them. Well, Grouch, Grouch could have done anything he wanted to. He yeah. was the one that said he wouldn't belong to the Hillsdale Golf Club. Anybody that would hire, what did he say? Anybody that would have him for the Yeah, when he, would, he wouldn't join it. Yeah, that's right. Was, he always thought of some way. But he was a very nice man, really. Yeah. And I, I'm one of the few people that liked his wife. I liked Joan. Uh, her name was, uh, the hell difference of my kids. I knew the kids through Arthur and Miriam. 
Groucho's children, you know, by Ruth. Ruth is his first wife. Yeah. The one they said was an alcoholic. Yeah. And, I, and I, Harpo married Susan Fleming. That's right. And Susan Fleming was in Hot Shot. Did you know that? Was she? She I, sure I as hell was. A million dollar lady. She I sure was. Yeah, ladies. she was in Hot Shot. But anyway, he, that was the last job I got. And it was a, it was a strictly through the agent. What was and the last the, job? The, go West. Was really? the last, yes. It was a fini for me, positively. And I got that job through Lynn Overman, who was trying to get a job in Hollywood himself. It was out in front of Rothschild's uh, men's barbershop, very fancy place on Beverly Boulevard. And I happened to walk by on my way to breakfast at Lindy's, which was a very good delicatessen. Mm, I think I can say a very good restaurant, but strictly... Strictly that way. Well, anyway, so Lynn was, he said, June. And I, I'm like, yes. I said, why, Lynn, what are you doing? One of those, you know? And he said, well, I'm, I just had my hair cut. Can't you tell? Which, of course, I couldn't tell. It was a joke. And, uh, and I told him I didn't have any job. But he said, I'm talking about the preamble to get me in to go west. He said, well, why don't you go to my agent? He said, I'll bet you money he would do something here. He said, he can't get me a job, but I'll bet he can get you one. Mm -hmm. And he did. He got me the job at go west. Of course, you I had, had, the best song I had to audition. You can't argue with love. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I did. That's a great I, song. The only one, wasn't it? I don't think the no, other. There were, uh, well, Diana Lewis sang something. Yes. Well, she sang a "Beautiful Dreamer." Beautiful dreamer, da da da. Listen to me or hearken to yeah, me or hearken. That's all we have to do is hearken. Hearken to me. And, yes, and she was then, a nice uh, little woman. There was one, as if you didn't know, which I think they cut. They did, oh, John Carroll had a good voice, but they didn't like him. Yeah. He was so sort of arrogant, wasn't he? Or yeah, he was very nice, a very nice guy. I had no trouble with him at all. Yeah, he, had nice he was, he was very nice. Well, in movies, he came over as being very Yeah, nervous. I know that he didn't get much work. He must have been something wrong. I never knew what it was. There must have been something. You never saw him? Yeah. Very, very nice looking. Clean. Oh, very nice. Yeah, good guy. But, uh, but that's the way it is. That was a, a big... And it could be considered a glamorous role for you. You didn't well, it, cause much attention to your to you as a celebrity or comedian. I don't think that I, I don't think I wouldn't recognize what celebrity meant. I never did have much of that. I had more celebrity fondness. Men liked me better, not because I was blonde, not because I dressed well, but because I was smart enough to carry on, which I'm not now, a decent conversation with them. Yeah. I seem to have lost that ability, but I, I think so. well, I, I try. I might have lost it, but no, I don't mean women were against me. I got along very well with Diana Lewis. Yeah, she was nice. Uh, Bill Powell's on the set a couple of things. She was married to him. Did you know that? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, then you know the story. Anyway, uh, I didn't see anything wrong with him. I thought he was a nice guy. Were Were you treated well by the by Groucho? Oh boy, couldn't have been better. How do you think I met his wife and was there twice for dinner? How do you think I met some of the people from the from the round table at the Algonquin? Right, and most wonderful food. And really, a very nice house. 910 Hillcrest, never will forget. Ninecrest, Hillcrest, Beverly Hills. So there Betcha. was no snobbery. No, no. And Grouchy wasn't on that man. He used to sing that uh, Lydia and Lydia. Uh, he, guy. he loved that. He used to play. He played guitar. Did you ever know that? Oh, he did. Yeah, quite well. He played quite well. Yeah. Movie. I said, do you really like that song? I didn't know how important that song really was. He loved that song. Oh, oh yeah. Did that. It's a great song. Oh, I thought it was ridiculous. I've, oh, got, I've got very peculiar taste. <laughs> I'm in a British cake, I guess. So quite, quite a feisty lady there, huh? Brilliant, yeah. Yeah, she's terrific. Interestingly, she, she got the role because Marion Martin, who we know uh, from The Big Store, um, was ill. She was originally cast in the role, and there are promotional photographs of her with um, the Marxists as Lulu Bell. Uh, but she she got she got ill and and had to pull out, and that's that's why uh, Jim McCoy was was cast. And uh, Marion Martin was promised a role in their next film um, in compensation, and she was originally going to be Martha Phelps. Um, Martha Phelps was going to be a a much younger, more attractive, uh, or you know, more obviously attractive woman. Um, and then when it was decided, because it was definitely going to be their their last movie, it might be an idea to get Margaret Dumont in. She was given uh, the role of Martha Phelps, and the and the role that Marion Martin does play was was created out of thin air just to to um, honour that promise.
Yeah, back to June, you you can understand how someone would give up uh, their film career after appearing in Go West. They were like, the <laughs> right? <laughs> it's interesting to hear what she has to say about John Carroll. You know, that uh, he had a great voice, but they didn't like him. Um, and that's the only explanation I've ever heard for the absence of the song, as if mm. I didn't know, which is in the credits and it's on the in the radio promo but yeah. not a trace of it in the film yeah and i can also vouch for uh, the merits of a british trifle <laughs> yes that was great wasn't it we, we gotta cut you make that our sound bite that we play as your intro <laughs> here's a fine english gentleman so anyhow after the after the stagecoach nonsense we're back to the saloon and groucho makes a, a dubious entrance Nobody can outshoot two gun quail. Boys, sweep them out of the gutter. Why, there's nobody out there. Well, sweep out the gutter. Hey, where's George S. Kaufman when you really need him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, t- I mean, talk about a missed opportunity, you know, uh, especially when the song begins um, and, and you can't argue with love. And June McCloy is singing this kind of torch song in a Western saloon music hall. Yeah. And Groucho is given all of this screen time interacting with her. He has a lot of what ought to be jokes. Um, He joins her at the end of the song, you know, standing on a table. This should be a great signature Groucho bit. And yet there is just nothing in it that is good or funny. It's another one of these times when you just feel embarrassed for him Mm -hmm. having to plod through the material he's been given. It's, It's not the song itself, which is fine. It's the jokes. I th- I think this is Groucho's lowest moment actually. I th- I know there are more there are more humiliating yeah. things like the uh, the walking on the ceiling scene in At the Circus. But uh, right. it, to me, this is this is his lowest point. He he as as Noah says, you know, he's given all that screen time. He's given uh, not just just jokes, but jo- jokes that are punctuations to a song which are supposed to build to a to a, a, a woofer yeah which is the uh put a wick in his mouth he burn for three days or something and then and then that propels him into the last line of the song every line is a dud yeah. every line is made yeah. worse than it needs to be as well i think by yeah. by his performance there's awful you know a like, goo let's break clean that you know and you rotter you scrounge and how we laughed you know it it is one it's the moment when most where i most want to look away out of out of you know sympathy for him and he's talking to arthur hausman you know the famous drunk uh of mm. hell roach and many other films of the era and i should note that Houseman is not playing drunk here. He's just really bored and not entertained by Groucho's <laughs> antics. He's, he's not drunk enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And part of what's so sad here is you know that Groucho had to work on this. Mm. I mean, if it felt like he wasn't showing up and he was just tossing it off, then if it seemed like he had some contempt for what he's doing here, mm-hmm. it might help a little. But no, it seems earnest, and yeah. that's part of what makes its atrociousness so mm. so much harder to take. The one line in it that I think is not terrible, time wounds all heals, is like a, such an old joke that must have been in hundreds of joke books before, you know, Brecker tossed right. it to Groucho mm. here. Yeah. You know, jumping back right before the song, we get these couple of racy moments where Groucho says, oh, Lulu Bell, I didn't recognize you uh, uh, standing up, you know, which you could obviously interpret it in a number of ways. And Brett Baxter telling Lulu Bell to go show Groucho a good time, which, you know, I, I don't know how else you're supposed to take that, but I'm sort of surprised that got past the uh, authorities. Although we, we now know, of course, that he has seen her standing up because she's, she stood up when, right. when he makes the revolving door joke, isn't he? So right. even, <laughs> okay. e- even on its own terms. <laughs> yeah, it's so ambiguous, yeah. <laughs> it's possible the censors just couldn't make it through this movie. Like, I got yeah. Some yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that explains the orgy scene at the end. You know, they just, they weren't, they weren't yeah. watching by then. <laughs> It does get filthy, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> so uh, Harpo ends up getting the deed back uh, from the register uh, during the song, uh, tossing all the, the cash away to get to it. And uh, Groucho then takes the deed and goes up to uh, to seal the deal. And to celebrate, Chico decides he wants to play the piano. And actually, this is a, a very nice piece he plays here. This is one of the more entertaining uh, Chico uh, piano solos, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. 
it's the, it's the moment that most needs that horse, though, because when he starts playing, uh, var <laughs> various other characters come on from, from left of frame and right of frame to watch him. Mm -hmm. One by one, yeah. more and more people appear. And at that point, the horse should rear up <laughs> in, in, in the bottom of the ring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is a, a relief, I think, when Chico sits down at the piano in this film, and you know that for... Two minutes, and it's exactly two minutes because Harpo times it. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, it's at least going to be an entertaining film. I and the stuff with the um, uh, apple or the orange. No, it must be an apple because or, or something. Harpo's about to take a bite into it, so it's a fruit with an edible peel, whatever it is. Mm. But but uh, that's nice. And I also kind of like the way Harpo sits next to Chico for this solo. He just kind of sits there and attends him. I guess the reason he's there is so that he can have do that fruit gag with Chico, but mm. something nice about it, Harpo just sort of uh, attending Chico's solo. Mm -hmm. It is strictly timed though, isn't it? He, he's told he's got two minutes or something, you know, which is, you know, too, too close to reality, I think. Mm. Yeah, and this is the Woodpecker song, which I think was a mm. hit song of the time. Right. Not the Old West, but the early 40s. And we also get a little of a uh, Listen to the Mockingbird, which most people know is the theme from the early Three Stooges films. Oh, yes. And when the tune is over, we cut upstairs, and Groucho is not getting satisfaction from uh, Mr. Beecher and uh, Mr. Baxter. He's not getting the money he expected. <laughs> not to mention yeah. Brecker and Pazell. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the more pathetic uh, uh, moments in the Groucho canon. He's being pushed around uh, verbally, and physically, he's being taken advantage of and mm. uh, ends up getting tossed down the stairs once again. Yeah. And so compare this with, with his scenes with, with Alki Briggs and uh, Joe Helton. Joe Helton, yes. yeah. Or Trentino in Duck Soup, or even his adversaries in opera and races. Groucho has far more nerve and audacity. You know, it's really very sad. He's cowardly. Yeah. He's bumbling and blustering. Yeah. You know, all the things that on some comedians are yeah. exactly right, but on Groucho. Yeah, are this would be wrong. a great Bob Hope scene. I mean, that bit mm. about the eyesight, that would be in his wheelhouse, not, not Groucho's. See that shelf down there by the bar? Yes. Do you see the bottles on the shelf? Yes. Do you see the corks in the bottles? Yes. You see that man sleeping at the table? Yes. See his nose? Yes. See the fly in the end of his nose? Oh, yes. You said he got good eyesight. Yeah, I think, as we've sometimes said about some of the other later films, there seem to be moments where Groucho, in both the writing and the performance, is specifically um, trying to match something of the style of Bob Hope and also Danny Kaye. Mm. I think some of the stuff in the You Can't Argue With Love number as the kind of material Danny Kay would have handled well, mm -hmm. although it would be very substandard material for Kay too. Yeah. But all that stuff that you were responding to, Matthew, uh, uh, the, oh, how we laughed. And it, there is a Danny Kay quality to some of that, that I don't know, when, when, when Kay did it, it was, I guess, not as offensive because it was not as um, contrary to his character. Um, although it's not like there are good Danny Kay jokes in there either. Mm -hmm. But you can, I think, we, as we've said before, you can see that Groucho is apparently trying to update his style to what is currently in vogue in comedy. Yeah, I mean, we could criticize the writing and, and everything all we want, but, you know, times have changed, and what people found funny in 1940 was not what they found funny in 1930. So, you know, you had to do that. You had to yeah. go that way. And we get the fall down the stairs because it was such a big hit in uh, Night of the Opera, so we thought we'd do that again. And we get that line, um, yeah. force brandy down my throat, which is quite, you know, not a not a bad line. Um, but again, it recalls the the where is the whiskey from uh, from Animal Crackers. And then we get the uh, showdown between Harpo and Baxter, and Harpo surprises him with the broom duster, and you know that's a great moment. It's, it's prime Harpo. It's not bad. You know, it's unexpected, which is what we want in a Marx Brothers film. Yeah, nicely executed, too. Harpo's manner and deftness and and uh, good cheer are, are all right on the mark here. And and the fact that he that he squares up to him straight, you know, so, so he's suddenly fearless in a way that none of them have been yet. Uh, you know, Groucho in particular is at his most 
cringing and inept, which is ni- neither are, are qualities we want from him. And, th- and, and then suddenly, when, when they're doing that, you know, that step forward bit, um, you know, Harpo is 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 absolutely, uh, you know, doing what he should be doing there. I don't understand though why when. Harpo pulled out his gun, Baxter pulled out his, and didn't shoot. He certainly deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> you think- <laughs> Did this guy, he's like yeah. threatening you, and then he makes a fool of you? Baxter should have just put one right into I, him. I know what you mean, but at the same time, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, if only some enterprising editor could work on this, Harpo could be shot dead on the spot right here. <laughs> Okay, so now that we're done here, we get a totally unnecessary scene. <laughs> Vandalus is singing "Beautiful Dreamer." Um, as we, Harkin, Harkin. Yeah, which, she doesn't actually doesn't say a, Harkin. Doesn't a nice job, nice little, nice little song. And then the brothers show up to basically explain what's going on. But and she's terrified by them. <laughs> it's like the delivering the letter scene from a night at the opera, but times forty. Two utterly mysterious things about it. One is that when she opens the door. They scare the hell out of her just by virtue of who they are. They're not. They're not doing anything menacing. It's just the Marx Brothers, and she's frightened. And then the, the- I guess this is all supposed to look uh, sympathy for them. But the only sympathy I have for the brothers right here is that they're in this film at all. <laughs> <laughs> Harpo has come with this because they think she's younger than she actually is. Harpo has come with an enormous rag doll that he's got strapped to his back. This is then given to her. She puts it in a chair, and nothing is nothing is done with it at all. Think, <laughs> thinking she was a baby. I mean, mm. Would you bring a baby, a doll that's like four <laughs> times bigger than a baby? I think it just happened to be one of their sex dolls that they said, "Oh, we better bring something." Yeah. <laughs> that does seem very much like a companion doll rather than a toy. <laughs> And there's also just some uh, more horrible, horrible lines here. I, I hate what, what is when Groucho says, uh, you know, he says, come on, miracle men. We also double at weddings yeah. mm. as best men. What are you talking about? Yeah, they've decided that this is something Groucho does now, you know, because he did it with Kitty Carlisle and he did it with more, you know, Sullivan. So this is this is now, you know, Groucho consoles the heroine. And they keep telling her that nothing's wrong. But she looks at Harpo's face and says, oh, my God, I can tell there's something awful that's going on. And since when is Harpo's face the uh, the clue that something's <laughs> amiss in the plot? <laughs> okay, moving on. Now we get to the big uh, safe cracking scene, which I guess is supposed to be one of the big comic uh, centerpieces of the film. Uh, I, I don't know what to make of this thing. There's parts I like, parts I don't like. It, it's, but it's a real mess either way. What do you guys think? I'll just let me just let me just pour a mint julep. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got anything on the Don Amici joke? Uh, I've I've got a contract out on it. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me a sort of unjustly celebrated line. It's fine, but it seems to me a very yeah. superficial film reference. Mm. Um, and and it would be alright if it was the only one like that. But he you know he does that over and over again, doesn't he? Yeah. Like I said, I don't, I don't know what to make of the scene. There's bits I like, particularly a little throwaway, a little incidental stuff more than the big gags, but whatever. It just seems like a lot of effort for very minimal payoff. I like them standing up and sitting down, you know, over and over again. That's quite nice. I like when Harpo does stuff like gets the, the first you think he's, he's, getting the drink just in his hat and then you realize he's got a little little can in the hat that you know that's quite nice and the bit with the magnet i like the fact that groucho says his father was called rufus i don't know I, there are incidental things in it that are funny but i i don't like um the way groucho and chico are playing drunk here um it, just because it seems both uncharacteristic of them and not very funny um if it were i, I would take either mm-hmm. of those two but it's it, it isn't either of them I don't mind the premise, actually. I'm certainly up for anything new and different, and we hadn't seen this before. Uh, we'd seen Harpo drunk or, or whatever in, in Coconuts, but the idea of Groucho and Chico getting drunk is certainly ripe with possibilities. Um, I'm just not sure they pulled it off here. I mean, one of the reasons... Yeah, yeah as it could have worked differently, but one of the reasons I don't like it is because it's another example of them being taken advantage mm-hmm. of. Um, if they were deciding to get drunk... <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. for some for some reason, then you know maybe that could be funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the, if the, although it's hard to imagine them needing to loosen themselves up, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, it's another example of them being sort of stooges yeah. in the in the narrative situation, and um, the repetitions of you know the toast to where we girls was born. You know, it'll make you giggle a little bit, but only because of the repetition. It's like the science of comedy tells you that if you do something slightly absurd three times mm. by the third time you'll 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 get some giggles out of it mm. but it's it's so misapplied um it makes us think maybe of the hard boiled eggs yeah. in the stateroom scene but in that case it's like it's wetting your appetite for the momentum of the comedy scene to come um here it's presented as though it's you know funny enough on its own and uh it just isn't mm-hmm. And I think some of Harpo's gags, although Harpo does have some good funny moments in this sequence. Um, I don't know. There's something about that big Looney Tunes magnet that I don't like. Mm. Uh, the stick of dynamite. It all feels a little beneath Harpo that he should be more ingenuous. Yeah, I think this is another one of those scenes where, where you, you just you scratch your head and you wonder what went on on that tour. Because you look at this and you think, this is a scene that has potential. You know, there's something, you know... The, the, this isn't a dead loss. This sequence, so I know. Let's let's take it out on the road and 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 work on it with an audience. But no, this is after they've been on the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, also we have this thing with the desk. Um, this will return in the big store. A Harpo has this encounter with a funny desk, <laughs> and it's like uh, you know, it's not that Harpo is funny. The desk is is funny. <laughs> You know, the desk is the comedian in that scene. Yeah. And this is not the way Harpo yeah. has traditionally operated. He's not... That was the moment where I said Curly Howard would have done this better, him getting frustrated with yeah. the desk. Mm. Yeah. Uh, even Chaplin, under the right circumstances, could do something like this with a funny desk. Mm-hmm. But Harpo, you know, should be delivering madness to a buttoned-up world, yeah. not playing straight man to a piece of furniture. And there's also a, a humiliation joke here, like uh, one that we d- actually didn't mention in the uh, the carriage. Uh, they they don't like the jerks in the carriage, and Harpo mm. and Chico uh, immediately go to leave. Um, there's the there's a line towards the end of this. Um, so they the villain says something like, "I I don't like your face," and Groucho says, "I suppose you think we like him." <laughs> I like that. That was like my favorite line. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Beggars can't be choosers, right? <laughs> And also um, the the bit at the end, which is quite you know quite good, where uh, people keep coming in saying put your hands up, and it's and it's a you know a representative of of a different uh, half each time. So it's it's one after another. You know the villains come in say put your hands up, and then a hero comes in and says put your hands up, and then a villain comes in and says put your hands up. Um, obviously, obviously the last one should be Zappo. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be great yeah. if he just walked in? <laughs> now that would save the whole movie. <laughs> Okay, so they get the deed back. Yay, they got the deed back. Is the film <laughs> over? No, it's not over. Oh, we still got some more to go. Okay, so the, the villains decide, okay, well, they're going to stop them from getting on the train the next day. So, yeah, nice tune, I, I have to admit. And we get all the brothers contributing. When else have we really seen that? Uh, I was going to say duck soup, but Harpo really doesn't do anything other than clap his hands and dance around. It is really, really nice, and it. Lydia, but it's, a little. It's in the wrong place, isn't it? It should have been. In, it should have been like half an hour in. Yeah. The you know the plot has just kicked in, and we're ready now for the for the frantic bit. You know the 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 and instead we get a song, and then we get that fucking Indian scene, <laughs> and it and it Matthew, just Matthew Matthew, I have, to, you, I have to correct you. It's fucking Native American scene. Okay. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Fucking, fucking indigenous America, America. indigenous scene. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. As soon as they meet Turner, then they should do Riding the Range, and it and you know it would be perfect. But it is a nice song, so so let's not. And we get to hear Chico sing for the first time, and only time other than Horse Feathers, right? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And Groucho strum his guitar. It is very nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Chico has a couple of lines at the end of uh, Day at the Races. Yeah. But yes, it's nice. And Harpo on the harmonica. Groucho, to, yeah, has an Italian accent uh, at one point. Yeah. It's nice. It's, it's also kind of nice. We've never seen it before, even though it seems pretty natural. The Marx Brothers kind of acting as the backup band for yeah. the male lead. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nice. Um, and it's kind of... It, the only time they're allowed to mm. not be funny is when they're playing music. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so it's fine. And um, it's a nice little song. I, I like Groucho's kind of cowboy harmonies yeah. and uh, the clippity clop stuff. And the lyric is by Gus Kahn, Andy Marx's other grandfather. Mm-hmm. And the music is by Roger Edens, who was a major figure in the mm-hmm. growth of the movie musical and a close collaborator and friend of Judy Garland. Hmm. And it does make you wish that they did that more often, you know, join in with with the with a straight song, uh, because it doesn't diminish them and it doesn't diminish the the you know the the romantic leads at all. It's it's just charming, and it you know it, it would be nice if they'd done that in more in opera and, and races. I mean, there is that lovely moment in the the one lovely moment in Tenement Symphony is when uh, suddenly Harper and Chico are involved in that. Um, right. it's all, it, it almost plays like a joke when they suddenly appear in that. Um, but yeah, it's something that they perhaps could have explored a bit more if they'd done a few more films at this point. Mm-hmm. So let's let's move on here. Now, I know that, first of all, this next scene obviously is not aged well and might cause this film at some point in the future to be on the list of uh, uh, things that get canceled. But as as of now, I'm just going to say, I don't mind the scene. I, it has a couple of laughs for me. Which, which, Name them. Name those laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> oh, um, um, uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> Caught you. <laughs> How does, <laughs> <laughs> I just remember watching this and saying, oh, at least this is better than the last half hour has been, whatever. I don't care, but well, whatever. It's got My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, which is another of Groucho's all-time worst moments. Uh, how about the moment when uh, Chico starts speaking to the chief in what sounds like mock Chinese, well, Chinese yes, gibberish? Yeah. <laughs> Ula! Ula! You want to know if you want starch in your shirts? Groucho explains it by doing a Chinese laundry joke, just to make sure that we're not only offending one group here. We want to, we can, we can use this to bother more people. <laughs> and they said we could tap it, which they did in the next film. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. They certainly did. Yep. Uh, I think the totem pole at the we see at the beginning of the scene. There's right. a totem pole, and it has Groucho's yeah. face is among the faces carved into it. Um, I, I find those moments interesting, not necessarily funny or good, but it reminds me of in Duck Soup when they paint his face onto the vase that's over his head, uh, yeah, using Groucho's image as this iconic thing. Um, it's interesting. It seems to kind of. Um, it seems like a meta theatrical joke in some way. It's funny actually because I I, I was always wondering if that was going to be a, a joke and the joke with that rag doll because all the time that that mm. Harpo comes in with it, you never see its face. It's always got its back to the camera, and then when he gives it to her, it's got its back <laughs> to the camera. And it's only at the very very last minute when she puts it down in the chair that you see the face, and it has got this very uh, over over expressive face painted on it. And I and I just thought, oh, is it going to be Groucho's face? Oh no, no, it's not. <laughs> but Margaret Dumont's face. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just for a moment, you know, I thought it was going to have a big moustache, and, and but mm-hmm. sadly, no. We can probably assume that the that totem pole was, uh, or at least that part of it was painted and it was used in another way. Yeah, it's a but, shame. It would have been uh, a great piece it, of memorabilia. Mm, boy, yeah. if it survived. Yeah. yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the scene ends with uh, Harpo's uh, solo on the... Uh, a loom, yeah. And this is kind of interesting. Because he does, I, I know that the harp performance itself is is not performed live on film and, and was dubbed over. Um, I guess we'll talk about that too. But it does seem like, at least on the on film, he is really plucking those strings, which seems hard to believe because it it also appears to be a loom um, that has half a blanket woven, you know, hanging from the bottom of it. What do you think this is? Do you think they built a thing that is playable like a harp and then fashioned it into a loom for the scene? Possibly, but my suspicion is no. My suspicion is that uh, he's just doing the, the hand movements that would be correct on a harp for that tune and that all the other people in that scene are stood there for about three minutes listening to, at most, the very slight twang of some pieces of string. <laughs> 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 I guess it also kind of follows up on the Day at the Races harp solo, the idea of an improvised harp. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, and the song he's playing is Land of the Sky Blue Water uh, by Charles Wakefield Cadman. Um, We've discussed in the past the fact that occasionally Harpo would have backup harpists um, who would either work with him uh, and, and sort of tutor him, or in some cases would record his solos or certain challenging passages within the solos for him. A controversial and point that many people resist. It's a controversial yeah. point. Yeah. We must say, there's no question, Harpo was a, an incredible artist on the harp. He played the harp really well, and on stage all those years, in vaudeville and Broadway, obviously nobody was playing for him. So he was a more than capable harpist. We're not saying it's all fake. Mm. But it is just true that occasionally he had some help with the filmed harp solos. And we know from, uh, among other things, uh, these interview clips from June McCloy that Peter Minton shared with us, that Harpo's backup harpist uh, on this film was uh, quite an eminent one, uh, Casper Reardon, who was a celebrated and kind of pioneering jazz harpist, a classical musician who went jazz and kind of revolutionized the harp as a jazz instrument, um, was heard on some great Paul Whiteman recordings and things, Mm -hmm. and died very young at the age of 33, one year after Go West was made. So here's June McCloy talking about Harpo and Casper Reardon. And then Harpo came on, you know. Did you ever know that? Oh, I bet you don't know this. You all thought that Harpo played that harp all the time, huh? Uh-uh. He had a backup harpist. Really? Oh, yeah. The most famous, you probably knew it, the most famous harp player in the world was hired back up. Harpo played harp, but not all that fancy stuff in there. Oh, he a guy, did? A guy sitting it back there. It Casper Reardon, was it? The harpist? Is he, is he the most famous one there was? He's a jazz harpist. Yeah. Jazz harpist. I bet that was cat. It bet, sounded like. Well, that's right. That's exactly who it was. That I don't remember names. He was quite young. Well, it must have been. But he I mean, and Harpo had. The minute he got on the set, Harpo didn't. He every it was a kiss off. Nobody else. He didn't pay attention to anybody. That guy and he were like this. They talked every minute. They played harp. They played the piano. They played this. They played that. And Frank Groucher said, "Geez, he's a good harpist, but holy cats, when's he gonna go home?" <laughs> he really did. He really did. He didn't. Oh, I didn't know it wasn't harp all the time. He played part of it, but not Oh, yes, part. he played harp. He did play a little harp. He practiced a lot, too. Yeah, but but when this guy was hired, but they, they, oh, they, they tuned up and did everything all the time. Two most beautiful harps you ever saw. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, that's... But that's probably who it was, the one. If you know that name, and he was a jazz harpist, yeah. yes. Most famous made, one in the country. Made, made records. Yeah, oh, yeah, Absolutely. So she doesn't confirm that it, that it, who exactly who it is. She just knows it's it's somebody was there helping Harpo. Yeah, I did look it up afterwards, though, after hearing this interview for the first time, and it is in some other sources that Casper Reardon helped Harpo out on on Go West specifically. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that brings us to the finale, the big uh, train scene, and uh, yes, it's legendary. Yes, it's well done. Yes, it's whatever you want to call it, but doesn't particularly make me laugh very much i gotta be honest um but people more accomplished and famous than i seem to really dig it uh i don't know uh joe adamson calls it among their greatest scenes and i'm certainly not gonna argue with joe adamson but if i was it would be right here (laughs) i mean i I can understand the relief that uh you know a a competent elaborate visual comedy scene Mm. comes on but that's about as far as I can go, really, and it doesn't do much for me. Uh, it's certainly not much of a Marx Brothers scene, yeah. um, you know, v- with the exception of maybe a couple of Harpo moments. There's there's not much in it that really um, capitalizes on what they do or what they do well. But uh, I agree with your point, Matthew, in a film that up to this point has been so consistently incompetent you know it's not just that the jokes don't work it seems like the people making this film don't really know or perhaps care what they're doing um and this really is an extended sequence that's very well pulled off it's not only competent but it's confident yes um you know it's just the scene is very sure of itself and um i appreciate that about it there are individual gags that come off very well and are nicely accomplished um, a little bit of Buster Keaton-ish stuff, too, with Harpo and the house 
I don't know that those gags necessarily look great on Harpo, but competent, precision, silent comedy mechanics. Yeah. Yes. Very, very professionally done. Um, the line, uh, this is the best gag in the picture, always gets my attention for being true. <laughs> it's certainly better than, uh, suppose, the, the engineer's name ain't Manual. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's like a joke you're you're you know somebody who isn't funny would make that joke. <laughs> but well let me go back to again what i said much earlier it's not that the scene isn't funny it's just you know for us it's not marx brothers funny we're not the audience for it yeah i mean i don't mind a bit of a bit of uh you know visual trick comedy you know right. as long yeah. as long as it comes at the end and as long as you've had your fill up until then so like when right. when when universal made uh wc fields films all end with a with a frantic chase you know that's fine you know the, 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 the at the end of the bank dick great you know because we've had an hour of fields being fields and so yeah let's kick back and have a chase you know and i quite yeah. you know i i don't dislike the the finales of at the circus or the big store i mean i appreciate that that, that there's nothing great or Marxine about them, but you know, I, I don't, I don't. Oh, they don't go. There. They don't go on fifteen minutes like this one. No, yeah. that's, that's right. I, I don't, but I don't, <laughs> I don't sit there with a sour face, you know, saying this yeah. isn't the Marx Brothers. I'm not standing yeah. for this. Right. You know, I, I, I don't mind. Um, with this right. though, I, I just think, you know, at the end of this film, I'm not, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even really gonna get too keen on this. <laughs> and it mm -hmm. has, it has got some, some dodgy stuff as well. Like there's the bit where. Um, Harpo gets Red Baxter's gun when they go through a tunnel. Uh, Sorry about that. Hold on. It's it's a college calling for my son. I got to pull out the battery on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Where the the the. <laughs> Where the villain, the villains have the drop on them, and then uh, Harpo, it, it, then it goes black because they go through a tunnel, and then. Uh, Red Baxter's gun has turned into a, into the into a whisk, uh, and that's Harpo. Harpo has done that in the dark, and that's you know that's nice. That's a bit of Harpo being Harpo. Yeah. And and then they go out. Harpo spins the gun on his finger, and drops it, and that's it. So he's lost that gun. So mm -hmm. he's he, you know he's just been inept. He's been extremely clever, and then the punch. You know the the the, the kicker is. Oh, then he then he loses. It. He doesn't throw it away. He doesn't do something reckless and pointless. Right. He just drops it. Yeah, I wondered about that moment. If I agree with you that if if the idea was to get the gun out of the picture, there could have been better ways of doing it. But I wondered if it was a choice. Like, if any of these characters are armed with a gun, then this is this ends too quickly, and so we just got to get the firearms <laughs> out of it. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, yes, there is a better way mm. to do that than have. Harpo be clumsy with it. Yeah. I, I wonder if um, there's reason to think that some of the budget cutting that went on with this film, uh, some of the reasoning here was we're going to put all our resources into this massive extended comedy sequence at the climax. And that's why we're cutting these other songs. And that's why the sets and costumes are so rickety <laughs> and all of that. Because uh, I think one of the things that does make this sequence go down a little easier than some of the rest of the film is that there isn't the sense that they're making do with limited resources, although maybe the comedic resources are running low. <laughs> yeah. uh, the scene doesn't seem to be like a bargain basement yeah, version. It could have been a lot of rear projection I mean, if they don't do that. Yeah. Only, the only, only when needed. That's a good but, point. Um, it's kind of impressive when the train is on the circular track yeah. going b around that house. Think, well, they really had to f make this happen on film, even if it's done with miniatures, which it doesn't exactly seem to be. Mm. Um, One of the issues here, and we this comes up a lot in the later MGM days, is that there's a comic scene going on, and then it's supposed to be punctuated by Groucho's interjections here and there, but they don't work at all, and you know, it, it almost would be better without them. You know, it's not, he's not really adding much. Yeah, that's absolutely it's right. It's like I've said, I've said many times, I think, in, in previous podcasts, you know, just thank God they don't bring Groucho when they rob Goliath's room in, in At the Circus, yeah. because if they had, he would, he would be stood to one side making crap joke after crap joke, and he would ruin that scene. Yeah. I'm very sad, but he would. Yeah. Uh, and we also, in this sequence, get the actual line. Uh, there goes our last chance to help out those kids. <laughs> <laughs>
You know, it's all worth it, though. It's all worth it to sit through the train scene, which I don't dislike. It's just not mm -hmm. the highlight of their career, which so many people paint out to be. But it's worth sitting through that. Why? Why? <laughs> it is. To, to get to that final gag where they've hired hundreds of extras. There's a big budget. They got this big scene, and then it leads to this fantastic moment. Oh, wait. It's not so great, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, Harpo hammering the uh, train official back into the ground in one of the most poorly directed gags of all time, which is totally framed wrong. So we're centered on the guy who's going to get hit with the, <laughs> with the backswing. This is wrong on so many accounts. And the brothers uh, shake hands and we fade out. And I think they're shaking hands because they're congratulating each other that they got through this film. <laughs> yeah, we can go home now. It's one of those yeah. moments, isn't it, that's very much like the end of You Can't Argue With Love. It, it, it's supposed to be a big crescendo. When they shake hands, that's supposed to be like the end of A Night at the Opera, you know, when Hopper rips the, the, the back of his jacket. And, yeah. you know, it's it, you, yeah. you can just tell that that's what they're, what they're aiming for. It's, it's a huge comedy crescendo. But in actual fact, it's, uh, you know... And just thank God they happened to have a musician there with a funny drum <laughs> to save that scene. You know, just what, what a stroke of luck that the musician they hired to bang that drum had a funny drum. <laughs> yeah, they must have got it at the same store where they got the funny desk and the drinking scene. Yes. And how many, how many years later is this scene, by the way? I mean, they've built the railroad and everything. It's going to be like five years later. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, there's a big time jump at the very yeah. end. <laughs> so so that's it we get at the end title which i don't i don't know once the film faded out i shut the thing off was there the end title where there end credits i had to get out of there as soon as possible oh you did so you didn't see the little scene after the credits no you didn't see the post credits oh boy what? oh man that's the whole film baxter and the doll <laughs> <laughs> no it sets up the big store i don't see how you could no. understand what's okay. going on in the big store okay. if you haven't seen that scene <laughs> So I was checking out some contemporary reviews from when the film first came out, and they were surprisingly good. I mean, they weren't overwhelming, and some uh, scribes certainly were down on it, but it, it got mostly positive uh, feedback. Uh, you know, I guess people were, were very forgiving or had short memories. Variety liked it. It was especially popular in the small towns. You look at those uh, exhibitor reviews that we like to look at, uh, the people in the rural areas really, really like this one, and you know, more power to them. You know, uh, these are the same people that had enough of them uh, when Horse Feathers came out. Yeah, it's funny with that, isn't it? Sometimes the contemporary reviews of the film seem to just be saying, "Oh, yeah, it's got laughs in it. It's a Marx Brothers movie. It it fulfills the you know the demand for some solid uh, yucks." Well, yuck is probably the proper term for it. <laughs> um, and then the somewhat more insightful reviews. Uh, I, the New York Times review of Go West is quite harsh. And from a position of loving them, but finding the movie very weak. What I'd love to know, um, which has obviously been, been lost because it wasn't recorded and, and none of these people are around anymore, is what the, the, the people who really mattered in terms of their great material thought of it. You know, did George Kaufman mm -hmm. see it? Did Robert Benchley see it? Did Maury Riskin see it? Hey, June mentioned that there were members of the uh, roundtable yeah. who were there visiting, so I wonder what they thought. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we know, you know, Groucho's letters um, all, always paint a negative. Like, so, she, you know, Sheikman, Sheikman got a, you know, a, the, the kind of Groucho that we wish was in the film, <laughs> talking, uh, talking about the film, you know. But, but did, you know, did Robert Benchley just think, oh, there's a Marx Brothers film on, I'll, I'll go and see that, and, and come away thinking, what the hell was that, you know? I saw these guys on Broadway, and, and they kicked ass, and what, what are they doing? <laughs> It does seem like some of the critical community at the time was very much on the same page that we are and that fans are mostly now, which is, you know, these guys are the greatest. There's nobody else like them. And it's sad to see them in such a shoddy vehicle, but it's still nice to see them. I mean, that's kind of been the, I think, the prevailing attitude toward these later films almost as soon as they were released. Uh, yes, it's true. There there are also glowing reviews of, oh, yeah, it's got a million yucks. Take your kids. Um, and there's also people who still <laughs> feel that way now and say, it's fine. It doesn't, not everything has to be animal crackers. This is funny. Shut up. I'm not listening to your podcast ever again. <laughs> I, 
can't I can't blame anyone if they enjoy the film. More power to them. It's a it's a comedy. You know, I want it to be something else. It's not what I want it to be. It doesn't make the world a worse place. Well, but at the same time, you know, there are, there are better ways to spend an hour and fifteen. It's not physically painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not actually agonizing. It's it's just a... <laughs> <laughs> um, it is, however, as the ad campaign tells us, it is rip roaring with laughs, mm. girls, songs. I think yep. we can all agree with that. Yeah. Yep. It certainly rip roars with laughs. It rip roars with girls, and it rip roars with a song or yeah. a song uh, and a half, isn't it? A song and a half. Yeah. <laughs> song and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nine dollars change, please. <laughs> so you guys got anything else? No. Okay. So <laughs> I think that's it. I'm amazed we've lasted this long. <laughs> so unlike the movie, we're not going to overstay our welcome here. We're going we're to get out of here while we still have some dignity. Well, I don't know. Maybe we're too late for that. So. <laughs> I don't know who wants who wants to pick the final song here. Who's got something in mind, Matthew? I think you got something you wanted to play here, right? Have I? Did I? Yeah. Or no? You're just you're just you're just treating me like Jay Hopkins, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I did. I, I of course I had a song in mind, and it's this. <laughs> Brothers Council podcast is produced and edited by Bob Gassell. Matthew Cunningham's books, The Annotated Marx Brothers, and That's Me Groucho are published by McFarland. Noah Diamond's book, Give Me a Thrill, The Story of All Say She Is, is published by Bear Manor Media. For more info on this and all episodes, visit our website at MarxBrothersCouncilPodcast.com. Also look for us on Twitter. And for the place to talk Marx and meet fellow fans, join us on the lively Marx Brothers Council Facebook group. See you next time! <laughs>